I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. This is James Altucher, and I am once again happy to have Brian Koppelman on the show. Brian was on the show a few months ago. But Brian, you only gave me 45 minutes of your time. And then afterwards, and we discussed this the other day, but afterwards, I kept thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm su- such an idiot. There are so many other questions I wanted to ask Brian. And he, you, you gave me, you, 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 you kind of suggested that I should be asking these questions almost. And I didn't ask, ask them, but now I'm going to ask them. I had a great time doing your podcast. And then, um, yeah, when you did mine uh, uh, Tuesday or the other day, it's mine uh, my podcast, the moment was up two days ago with you on it. Uh, I tried within our hour to get everything in. It's you know, it's just hard to get everything done in the limited amount of time, isn't it? It is, and you know, the other thing is, I mean, what do you? I, okay, forget all my questions for a second. What do you think about the format of podcasting? Because if I were to watch two guys, two talking heads on TV interviewing each other, I'd get bored probably listening for an hour. I don't think you would get bored um, if they were able to forget the cameras and just be themselves. I think that the cameras have a disruptive influence on the conversation in a way that the microphones don't. That, ah, um, interesting, because it's almost like the brain's multitasking there. Somehow you're aware, you know, um, whereas here there's an intimacy to podcasting. I love podcasts. Uh, I, I wrote about WTF a couple of years ago, and as I was writing about it, it, it was part of what made me know I wanted to do one. WTF being Mark Maron's excellent podcast. Yeah, I wrote about this episode he did with Jim Brewer. For, I wrote about that for Grantland at the end of the year in, I guess, 2013. And um, I guess I'd already known I, I wanted to do it. There's something about people who were drawn to this um, as hosts. There's um, Because it's not an industry that is quick money and because there's not even it's not even clear uh, that there's real money in it um, except for a few people, the the – the folks who want to be on the side of the mic asking questions are there because they're incredibly curious and they have a point of view. And so listening to what they then are able to dig out is really compelling in a way that many other things aren't. So, um, I want to, I do think there's a way to do it on television, but uh, it's, it, it's hard podcasting because of the length of the form uh, allows the adrenaline to wash away, allows the calculation to wash away and, 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 um, forces people, I think, to be legitimate and to have these conversations in a real way. So, so, so I want to I want to briefly intro you if, if for anybody who hasn't um, heard our last podcast. You uh, wrote some of my favorite movies: Rounders, uh, Ocean's Thirteen, 
Um, a Solitary Man. Solitary Man, one of my all-time favorite movies. And Rounders. Nice. I, would, I would put both of those in my top Thank ten. you. Well, two of those I wrote with my lifelong creative partner, David Levine. And the Who's third, also been on this podcast. Yeah, and the third, Solitary Man, um, I wrote but, and Dave and I directed together. So, yeah, thanks, man. I'm so glad to know that you are our demo. Solitary Man I've watched three times now. I've watched uh, twice on my own and once with my wife. And, and I'm a big fan also of Jesse Eisenberg, Michael mm-hmm. Douglas. So everybody... Uh, in the movie was great. You know, he that's, great that's the movie of ours that means the most to me. And so the fact that, and, and you know, it, it and was, rounders, of course, as yeah. I mentioned on the last one, changed my life. I started playing poker nonstop for a year after I saw that. No, movie. I know. But if you tell that whole story again, then you're going to walk away from this podcast feeling like right. you didn't ask me the questions. So here's, ask me. so here's, here's where I, what I missed, what you, what you threw down on the mat in the last one. And I didn't ask about it. You said during a solitary man, while you were writing that yeah. you got stuck. And you, you started – you got stuck in a really bad way is the impression I got afterwards. And, and you started doing stand-up comedy. And I, I – w- what do you mean? I mean it was, it was a brilliant movie about kind of the way uh, a man who's, who's slightly older, who's kind of down and out. Like he's, he's kind of hitting a low point, but he's grasping for his youth again. And how did you get stuck and, and what happened? And I, I want to get granular as you put it. We can get granular. Um, what happened is that I – well, you have to go backwards. I have to go backwards, which is that accepting – for me, I came to being an artist later than most do. You know, I was 30 when Dave and I wrote Rounders. and That doesn't seem old at all to me. Right. Well, now it doesn't. Uh, from, from here, I'm 48. But – when you're 30, you do think to yourself, um, if I were going to do it, I probably would have. And But, you know, I, somehow, you know, Dave and I got together and, and lifelong best friend, and we wrote that script and then got ourselves uh, in, in a position where we were able to quickly do a f- few more movies. We had made four movies or five movies that we'd written. We directed one. Always as a a team and the i and, and i will say it, there was an incredible power there is an incredible power in having a creative partner because the the burden isn't entirely on you there are days that dave carries the ball downfield there are days i carry the ball downfield the other guy blocks um so that's a sports metaphor i apologize james but most <laughs> of the people in your audience will understand it i think i got it uh but a few a few things happen with with Salisbury. So so for a long time before I was thirty, a big part of me knew that I wanted to write. I knew that I knew that I had the ability to create an emotional reaction in the reader. Basically, the response. My friend Derek Hass, who's created um, all the Chicago Fire and um, Chicago. Uh, PD and those shows and has written a bunch of books told me about himself that, that he realized at a young age, if he wanted the reader to feel scared, the reader would feel scared. If he wanted the reader to laugh, the reader would laugh. And so he knew I, I, I didn't think of it in that conscious a way, but I knew that for two paragraphs or three paragraphs, um, I could, um, kind of dazzle, um, a reader, whether it were, it was a teacher, a girl I'd write a letter to, um, but I could never get past a page, two pages. I, I lived as a blocked creative person. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find a way to power through the, the moment after the initial inspiration wore off. And is that because you wanted to finish fast or... You know, or uh, well, is it just you ran out of things to say? I, the, I, at the time, I would have said it was a lack of discipline, a lack of focus, mm-hmm. laziness, um, but it was fear is what it was. It was, uh, it, it was that the, the moment I had to start really working or I would allow myself to kind of catch up and read it, I would see the limitations in what I was doing. I would think, oh, well, let's glib or that comes easy to me or the fact that it comes easy means... Um, you know, that it's thin or basically what would happen is I would find other things to occupy my time. So, uh, you know, as you know, I had a 
successful career doing stuff. Um, I went to law school at night and graduated. I was kind of doing everything I could not to, to do this thing. Dave and I started making these movies. They, you know, uh, we've both told the story. Each of us have told the story on your podcast that, you know, the initial idea for rounders being a movie set in this poker, uh, world. I mean, I came up with that idea, told it to Dave. He said like, let's figure out who these characters are. And we sat down and went to work writing it when the idea but, but what I had never done in all that time was really drill down on um, that I had changed, that I had got I'd gotten past thinking of myself in this old way, that um, that I had lost this atavistic idea about myself, right? This idea that it out outlived its, its usefulness, which was that I was an executive. I was not an artist. I was not a creative person. There was something terrifying about being that. So when I had the idea for Solitary Man, and it was so important to me, and I wrote the first 20 pages very quickly. Can I ask why was it important to you? Because the inciting incident, the thing that made me want to write it, happened to somebody that I cared about. And I knew very well. And so that is somebody who kind of lost everything in some kind of, no, the, 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 well, I knew a couple of people who were like the main character, Michael Douglas's character, but the woman that Jenna Fisher plays, whose dad acts Mm. towards her in these ways. I saw that happen in front of me. I saw that transpire. And in anger, I wrote like the first 20 pages. And I think I told you this last time, but I knew a couple things. One, I knew that that character of Ben Kalman, I knew that was really good. I knew that I'd captured a voice that I'd always wanted to and that he spoke and, and, and was like a living, breathing creation you hadn't really seen on a movie screen before. Well, and, it, and it's sort of, a, uh, you know, everybody goes through that. We get people get older and, and they want to grasp at youth, but they combine that right. with kind of the story of loss and gain. And well, so I remember I, I wrote these 20 pages, then I quickly wrote down very quickly. Um, it, it's only happened a couple of times in my life. I, I, I wrote down, uh, scene, 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 meaning I knew, okay, we're going to meet Ben with his daughter. We're going to meet his ex-wife. He's going to be asked to take his. Is that I, how you write it? You write it scene and then kind of just an outline. Well, I no, I wrote I wrote um, initially like fifteen or twenty pages the the opening scene and I wrote them longer, but I basically wrote a whole bunch of stuff that happened. I wrote the scenes like with the dialogue and everything just in a fit one morning, like in a few hours. I just like blitzed out a bunch of pages and I called my wife in and I was like, "Read this." She's my best reader, always has been. She's a great novelist. She's written and published three novels and wrote a movie that was at Sundance this year and mm. called I Smile Back, starring Sarah Silverman. She's a great writer and has an incredible bullshit meter. And she said, um, this is great. This is a movie. And um, and you got that character right. But So I'd, but I'd written those pages, and then I, I knew a whole bunch of stuff that happened up to like the midpoint of the movie. But I knew that stuff in an instant, James. So with the moment I started writing the movie, I knew um, he was asked to take uh, – the, the, the woman he was dating, he was asked to take her daughter back to his alma mater. I knew what would happen there, and I knew the result of what would happen there. And so I knew where he would be left, and I knew then that he would go back up to that college one more time. So even I knew all that stuff the first day I started writing, but then I had no fucking idea. So I was able – so then I went to the office, and I read Levine – um, these first like 18 pages or something. And I knew the movie was called, the song Solitary Man was there. I had put that song, I knew that that Johnny Cash version of the Neil Diamond song would play over the opening and I'd written that all in the script. And I read it to Dave and he said, um, you did it. Like that's an incredible voice, um, but we're not going to write this one together. You have to write it because it's clear that you have the tone um, down. So you got to write it and then yeah, we should direct it together, but you got to write it. So, um, I then in my in, – in odd time, when I had the time, I would go back to it. And I was able to write up to the midway point of the movie. And I would – would, it was hard. I was writing by my, really by myself for the first time. Now, I'd written essays and I'd done a bunch of stuff. 
But part of me still felt like a fraud. Part of me still felt like somebody who um, relied upon a partner who was... Di- I was a kid with ADHD, so finishing anything was always hard for me. But And I knew my partner, Dave, is one of the most... Uh, he, he is the single most um, uh, rigorous, responsible human I've ever met. So anytime that I would... Uh, my discipline would wane, Dave's there to go like, no, we're going to work another two hours and like fight our way through and do the stuff that would then stoke my creativity one more time. But when I had to do it for myself, a a few things happened. One, I was like, I don't think I'm smart enough to really figure out where this character should go. So even though you had done five movies by then, including, yeah, I mean, I was blocked, stopped in the middle of, uh, I mean, we were making oceans 13 and, um, I was on set every day of that movie and had written that movie with Dave and the, you know, two of us wrote, you know, uh, all the lines in that movie, um, Steven Soderbergh probably kicked in a couple, um, definitely did. But the two of us wrote that movie, and um, and I still couldn't quite. You know, this is when the reflection of time. But the, all I can tell you back then is my head would hurt. You know, I couldn't find a way. And what was maddening was I knew I had these like fifty-five pages that. Uh, represented something incredibly real. And that if I could finish it, I knew we could cast it and I could get the movie made and we'd be directing a movie star in a movie. And I couldn't do it. And um, and it wasn't a conscious choice. Like what it. would happen? You would sit down and you had you had your your outline basically. Yeah, but I'd, re- I'd written to the end of the outline. I knew I had written to the end of the outline. I also knew the very, I will say, I knew the very last scene. I knew it would take place on this bench. Uh, and I knew basically what Great would happen. Scene. I didn't know exactly like the, the the exact thing that the character would decide, but I knew they would be on this bench, and I knew what that meant. But then there were fifty pages that I couldn't figure out what would happen. I had this one because I had a, a thought of what it should be, and I couldn't figure out how to make that happen. So yes, I would I would look at the document, I would read it and reread it, and I would um, just think of myself as a failure and a loser. And um, so that's, that was what, so you're you're looking at a blank screen, and you were like. This, this is it. My career as a writer is over. Well, no, I mean, it was fun. No, because I'm still doing this thing, but I think I just thought, well, I can't, I can't solve this problem. It's maddening that I can't solve this Would problem. Would you try going down different directions and then back up and... Well, I had this one clear thought that, um, of what I thought needed to happen to get to, to the end. Somewhere along there, I started as I was, would, you know, I would, back then I would sometimes do the artist way, just journaling as in Julia Cameron's book. And sometimes I wouldn't. And, um, I realized that a thing, I was 40 years old and that a thing I had always promised myself was that I would do stand up comedy, but that fear was holding me back from doing that. And I didn't really connect it in the, that, that really what was holding me up on Salisbury man was like the fear that I would finish it and it wouldn't be good enough, and I wouldn't be good enough, and I'd be a failure. So when I got this notion in my head as I was approaching my 40th birthday that um, the, the main thing I was afraid of doing was stand-up, I decided I was going to do it, and I was going to do it the way that um, that we the people begin. I was going to go to open mics, and I was going to take a stand-up comedy class, and I did all that stuff. So, so uh, l- l- let ahead. me ask. Let yeah. me back up on that. So, so you 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 made this conscious decision. Okay, there's something I'm afraid of, but I've always also been afraid of doing stand up comedy. Um, I was much more out of control than that. Like mm-hmm. I was much more just walking around. You know, it, it wasn't it, afterwards I realized that the stand up comedy enabled me to deal with failure a certain way. Because you stand up there and you could die. And when you bomb, it's brutal. And that it kind of kicked something loose that enabled me to go back to Solitary Man, which I then... So I did stand up for a year and a half. And okay, I did so, it. so I, re- I want to understand that. So, we can go slowly. So, 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 so you took a comedy class. You started going to open mics. Now, it does seem to me that 40 is old to start doing stand-up. Uh, yeah. I mean, what were your, what were your, some of your acts? Like, what were you doing stand-up about? Well, I was talking, um, I was talking about my life. I, I mean, I still have the tapes. I have like, I don't know, I must have recorded like 85 shows. I still have the Would recordings you to them of afterwards? the 85. Sh- yeah, I did it. I approached it with real seriousness. Mm-hmm. I, um, did you think you were going to be like a professional comedian? 
No, I didn't think I was going to be a professional comedian, but I, yeah, I, I needed to pass. I knew I needed to pass at at least one club where I could go during the week and really do it. I knew that um, passing a club means you could go get up and perform there, and you're not doing like open mic nights, and you're not doing bringer shows. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up getting together like seven to ten minutes that worked, so that one out of three nights it would go really well, mm-hmm. and one out of three it would be bumpy, and then one out of three it would be crappy. And I was learning how to do it. And I made friends in the comedy clubs who are still my real friends now, guys who've become famous. One who was famous already, one who's become famous since. Um, and we did open mics together. And uh, it's getting up. And so I would do it four nights a week. I would meet Dave in the morning. We would write. Uh, I would go home, see my family. And then at 10 at night, I would go out. And um, Amy is incredibly supportive. My kids were incredibly supportive of it. They knew how much it, it, it meant to me. From the time you decided to start doing stand-up to the time when you went to your first open mic, how long a period was that? Short. Once I said I was doing it, I knew I had to do it right away. Like, so mm-hmm. I found a class. I went to an op- Yeah, I found a class. Then I went to an open mic. Um, open mics are so strange. Most of the people are crazy in them. Uh, really, you know, they have no business being there. You find, like, one smart person. There were, like, two smart people. I could tell could do it. Um, so I knew right away just being, um, sane and relatively smart gave me some leg up, uh, and, or a a possibility of being able to do it. Then a few comedians saw me do early open mics and told me I could do it. Mm -hmm. They were like, Oh, you're funny. You're not funny yet, but you're funny. And, uh, what does that mean? Like, what did they say? Well, well, I think they saw that I was, um, kind of comfortable on stage and that I was qu- if if I got knocked off what I realized is um if I was able to get be present so if I got knocked off of whatever I'd gone up there and like um at first you know because I'm a writer I really wrote the stuff I wrote it out and memorized it which is not what you, you should most very few comedians that's how they work um but when I would get kind of knocked off course by something that would happen I would able to be quick enough to make funny stuff happen and I could survive um but but I bombed enormously. I mean, early on I would get up and I mean, just, you know, I beefed time after time after one funny joke, you know, one thing that would work and the rest of it, nothing, just silence, apathy, angry apathy uh, from the audience. Like you could feel it. Oh, it's the most palpable thing you can. Yes. It's, it's, and, uh, but I would go, you know, man, I would like go from an open mic to like a friend would know there was a show at a bar downtown and we would go to the, like four of us would go to this bar downtown where, where people were drinking and not even listening and you would pay three bucks to get up and do five minutes at this bar. You'd have to buy two drinks, um, which I don't really drink. I'm not a non-drinker, but for me, two beers and I'm fucked up. So I would give my drinks to some other comedians or something. I would go, we would go to another bar. We would go to some place um, uptown and I just... Slowly in doing that, a bunch of the fear lifted, you know, because then I would start to take pride in, in bombing and hanging in the room or showing up the next day, or then you would turn the crowd and, buy, and you know, somehow get them. Uh, and, and so while it was going on, um, I guess, Solitary Man was playing in the back of my head. Uh, and I would say I would think about it almost every day. I would open it, look at it, and not understand why I was stalled. And finally, I took this, I'd scratched out to page like 60, and I gave it to a friend of mine, one of my best friends, somebody named Davit Sigerson, who's had just an incredible life, actually. And um, he's a brilliant person. And I said, Dav, I wrote these 60 pages. And can you just read them and tell me if I'm crazy? And he read them. And he said, you're totally not crazy. What do you think the next thing should be? And I told him, and he said, I think that's, uh, you're going down a blind alley. We don't want to see that thing happen. What, what was the thing that he didn't want to well, see Well, people happen? haven't seen the movie, but okay. um, this would be a good time to like go watch the movie because I'm about to say spoilers. <laughs> um, so I'd always thought that he would go back up to the college to really go chase the girl that Imogen Poots played and that they would end up having like a real thing for a period of time there. 
at the I college. I see. So this is where she you blew them all, and I was stuck trying to figure that out. And David said, "No, no, no. That character got everything he." Because David that said that doesn't make sense, right? David said that he got everything he needed out of that um, thing. The movie has everything it needed out of that moment when the mother sees them. He can go back over the college, but that's not why. I think that's an important point. Like everything that had happened until then made sense, but now you wanted to go down a path that didn't. That was sort of. But like, I couldn't figure it out, and he didn't fantasy. know what. The, yeah, he didn't know what the path should be. He just said, "I think that's a mistake." But the path ended up being. And I'm not going to give a spoiler, but the path ended up being about friendship. Y- yeah, in, in sure, about figuring out who he was, and he still goes out to the college. I, I the thing is, I conflated these ideas. Um, but those specifics matter less than um, than that. I finally had the guts to like give the sixty pages to somebody. He looked at them. He tossed out this thing that I'd been carrying in my head the whole time. But because I had been doing stand up, which was about getting up, getting rejected, trying again, changing it, staying in the moment, staying present, somehow when he said that, it enabled me to look at the thing in a fresh way. Now I will say this is about three and a half years after I first started Solitary Man. And then it was coming to be August. August, uh, I knew my, Amy and I were taking the kids somewhere for a few weeks. We'd rented a house. Um, and I decided I was going to put in a couple of hours an afternoon and just no matter what, get to the end of it. And I'd, I, I did it. She, the kids, they would go out for a couple hours. I would sit down, and I just said, forget the quality. Don't be a perfectionist because that was the other big problem was wanting, knowing how, how you know, um, that knowing that to my own standards, the beginning was super strong and, and feeling the pressure that every page had to be that strong. And, and I just sat down and immediately just banged out the outline for the rest of it and then forced myself to just write the scenes. Even if I thought they sucked, I was like, find a way to write the scenes. And I wrote all the scenes in like three weeks. I wrote the final 55 pages and then, except for one scene, I wrote it, wrote it, finally finished, rewrote that stuff, knew it was like tied together with the beginning and I had something, but I was missing one scene and I couldn't figure out what it was and it was driving me crazy. And then I was on a cross town bus um, and uh, suddenly I realized he needed to return the shirt to Jesse Eisenberg and mm-hmm. that scene popped into my head and I sat down on the bus and I just wrote it in longhand in like this little black notebook that I carried everywhere with me. And I wrote that I think scene. A, by the way, that's a key point. Many people I've spoken to carry around notebooks. You cannot wait to write down. No, I mean, I really write everything down on my iPhone, on the notepad on my iPhone. But um, but I did have a notebook then, and I, I, I still do, but I use now I use this thing. Um, but I did, wrote the scene down, got to the office. I said to Dave, like, I need five minutes. I went in the other room. I just, I just transcribed what I had written. And then I knew when I wrote that scene where he gives a shirt back to Jesse Eisenberg, um, I was like, Okay, that character is now come to where he needed to come to. The and I knew that the movie was basically done. I showed it to David and Amy. They both um, very quickly said, "Like, well, that's really a movie. Like, you know, you did the thing. Like, figure out how to put it together." And then, you know, equally, I, I will say, uh, people asked me to change the ending, and um, they I knew we could have gotten more money if we would have changed the ending. And I talked about this a little bit on WTF. But I, the thing I don't think I said was um, all these experts were telling me that we couldn't get it made, that we couldn't raise the money because it was a dark movie, because it was about an old man, because of all these issues. Uh, and uh, I started to believe them. And so I went on Nike ID and I made shoes for myself. I made these um, sneakers and I had the word uh, solitary um, put in bright pink a hundred times on each shoe. And I wore the shoes every single day from when I finished the script and people told me we couldn't get it made until the first day of shooting. And so that I would look at the shoes and anytime I looked down and saw solitary, it would ma- I would make myself take one step towards getting it made. I would make one phone call or send one email, do one thing to push the movie forward. And I wore the shoes every single day until we got the movie made. Were you scared during that period that it would never get made? Or were you, did you have this eerie confidence? I knew the, the movie shoes? would get made. I was like, because I knew that 
It has so it's, to. it's like the 1% a day thing. Like if, as long as that one email goes out, it's the effect compound. I knew I had to do something every day um, that I was believing it was something Tony Robbins had said to me uh, or had said at a, um, in a book, you know, about uh, – or actually it's something he had said on his Get the Edge program, which was that we give too much power to experts because it's, it's easy then to tell ourselves it's not our fault. Um, and I had given power to the people whose job it was to raise money for the movie. Um, what was the first breakthrough? Did like an actor come on? Or? Steven Soderbergh read it and said, um, I, I can get it to Michael Douglas. I believe in this. You guys should direct it and Michael should star in it. And I, he agreed with us. And he sent it to – he said uh, – we said, then you produce the movie. So he gave it to Michael. But even with Michael, it took a year to raise the money. And so that's what I'm saying. I knew I had Michael. I had Steven. We were directing it. But early on, people said, well, if you make the ending more just um, clearly happy – um, we'll give you the money. There were things we could have done to soften it, to, to really get more money, but because of the you know, cost of writing it, how hard it was, I just refused. So and you know, it's not like, uh, I just want to say, you know, I didn't know, you know, the movie wasn't some big hit. It made its money back for everybody. It was, um, it, it ended up uh, on Roger Ebert's year-end best list, on the New York Times year-end best list, on like Matt Zoller's sites, like these very important critics, you know, got an A in Entertainment Weekly, all this stuff, but it wasn't a huge commercial hit or anything. It was just, um, it did end up being the movie that was in my head and then in my and David's head when we directed it together. And it, it did, it did live up to the, 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 the thing I'd hoped and was terrified that I couldn't pull off the day that I first sat down to so, write it. I don't want people to think they're going to go see the Godfather too. It's a small little movie. Um, and it's a small little character study. That's, that's all that it is. It just was something that was really important to me, because it was, you know, my, my dad had gotten sick and then gotten better. So that was another thing that had happened. My dad's great now, and he and I have always been incredibly close. Um, but I think seeing my dad struggle with mortality and me struggling with it helped. That was another piece that helped me understand what that character might also be going through. But it seems like a big defining factor in the cre- both the creativity process and the execution process is some amount of fear. Like, so something inside of you was telling you, I need to shake things up a little bit. So the first time you went out and you did something totally different that you were completely afraid of, which was go in front of an audience and tell jokes, something that no other guy you knew probably was doing. And so I, I don't even know, like, what, like the first time you went up on stage, like, what did you think of? You, you probably had something written because of the class, uh, and this shook you up a little bit somehow, writing, writing comedy. What? What are your like tips on comedy? You're giving you give screen screenwriting tips all the time on Vine, but what made you think you can do comedy? And what made you think your first set was going to be funny? Or well, I didn't know. Even though I'm 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 completely dry and not funny now, um, because it, I'll tell you, <laughs> doing stand up takes <laughs> doing stand up just takes all the pressure off of you to be be funny in other times. But um, no, I could always make like a room full of people. That was just a skill I always had. Like if I went to pitch a movie, I could make everybody laugh. Dave and I together could. You know, in law school, I can make the whole... I, I was always... Um, but does that one, translate I was to always, the stage? Well, no, but I'm saying when you ask what it is, right? Yeah. It's like, um, you know how they always say, like, the best-looking person in every town goes to Hollywood? So everybody who's the funniest kid or second funniest kid in his class thinks um, that he could, you know, can go be a comedian. Uh, and I'd, I'd studied. I mean, I loved comedy. I knew comedy albums by heart and all that stuff. Who were your favorite comedians when you started? Well, it depends on the time. And this comedian named Alan Havey is a New York comedian... Um, was my favorite comedian, but George Carlin and Richard Pryor and Steve Martin. And, um, but I knew every, I knew all the, you know, Paul Reiser and, um, I just knew every comedian's work. Big J at that time when I first was going in the clubs, Big J Ogerson, um, uh, who has been on my podcast recently with somebody who I thought was in- incredibly hilarious, Gary Goldman, uh, all, all these people, um, I was doing originally the stuff I was doing at first was, um, was probably not very autobiographical at, at, at first. It was um, it was odd. It was very writerly. And then, you know, you get called. The, the, what happens in the beginning is all you want, you get desperate to get laughs, so you go to the most base material that you have. So, you know. Um, A lot of fart jokes. Well, I wouldn't tell fart jokes, but you end up telling dick jokes because they get laughs. And uh, so I started doing that. And then I started, no, I started, like, building um, a, a routine that, 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 that mostly... Uh, 
you know, that held together and had like a unified tone. But once I proved to myself that I could do it, I mean, that flame was extinguished for me in, a, in that I didn't, I'd answered the question, you know, do I have the balls to do this? Can I do it consistently? Can I not quit? Can I deal with uh, the hardship in it? Um, can I stay calm when a heckler shows up? Can I be mean enough to dispense with the heckler while not losing the rest of the audience? And I kind of went through all those reps and then became friends with a bunch of the comedians and felt accepted and felt a part of it. Um, and, and somehow was able to then, you know, look, I realized, oh, I have this incredible life where I'm making movies, which is really what I want to do. I have this family. I, 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 I'm not cashing all that in to put in, you know, I got, definitely got to a moment where I realized I don't know if I can be great at this. The only way to find out if I can be great at it is to devote everything I have to it, meaning to do 25 sets a week, only think about writing jokes, and I didn't need to. Now, I'll say weirdly, James, it pays off. You know, I was on Seth Meyers' show three weeks ago. Sure. I watched it. And um, Funny. I was funny on the yeah. show. Yeah, it was great. And uh, yeah, the, the joke you told about Paul Giamatti uh, looking at the ground, you were yeah. really, really embarrassed. Well, it was great. Thank you. But um, there's no way that I could have done that mm -hmm. if I hadn't done the year and a half stand-up. Mm -hmm. No way I could have walked out there and kind of been funny on command and, and you had a with challenge. Seth. You had a challenge because you go up there. It's like you point out you're a writer, so it's not like you're in front of a screen every day. The audience doesn't know you, so you kind of have to like stand out a little special. Right now, I knew you know Seth uh, listens. To, he was a guest on, on my uh, podcast, the moment, and he's uh, a fan of the podcast, and that's why I think he wanted me to come on on the show. But I did feel this obligation to be out there and to be able to pitch and catch with him. And and um, so I thought about what I was going to say. And we, and like I'm not, I didn't go out there and you know I didn't I didn't rip it up like uh, you know the first time Seinfeld was on the Tonight Show or something. But and Seth was incredibly generous to me and made sure that my jokes landed. But uh, the adrenaline that hits you in the moment before the curtain opens and you walk out is only stand up prepared me for the jolt of adrenaline that I had to somehow rein in as I went out to do that, to go talk to so, him. So, so connect that back to then giving you the energy to, to bring you back to solitary man. So it seems like you got stuck in one area. Yeah. You took a kind of yeah. peripheral area, not completely different, but peripheral, and but also one where you can use your fear to move you forward. And you, but you got out of the box enough that that sort of shook up this. Yeah, other man. Box. But I mean, we constantly. I mean, I started the podcast probably for similar. Where I was like, I love this. I'm really interested in it. I love podcasts the way I love comedy and movies um, because of the intimacy of the form, because of the amount of the way you know. I have this. I'm incredibly curious, and I'm constantly trying to learn in every area. And uh, I don't know. I didn't know if like you know. I did a couple of guest appearances on on pods. They went well, but. I had no idea that I could really do it. I had a big form um, because uh, uh, Bill Simmons trusted me and gave me uh, a show on Grantland, and he and Dave Jacoby. And uh, I could have really flamed out, you know, and it could have been terrible. But again, like, I just always want to put myself on the edge of a creative fa failure. Now, I don't want to put my family at risk. I'm not going to... I don't need to... I don't need to be on the edge of uh, financial ruin. I don't need to... Um, be, ruin my marriage. Um, um, but, but I do need to challenge myself creatively. I do need to, um, become very familiar with and friendly with looking down and knowing that the ground is no longer there and having to find a way to stay afloat so that I don't become complacent in the work so that the fear that everybody has when they face the page isn't insurmountable so that I can keep moving forward because it's always scary, dude. Right. So, so, so let's say I'm a listener and I'm sitting in my cubicle and my job, my, my dream has always been to either write a novel, a screenplay, do stand up, but I, I blame it on time. I blame it on kids. I blame it on responsibilities. What do you tell that person to kind of break well, out of I'll that I'll say fear? a few things. One, you talk about the value of relationships and I just luckily married the perfect person for me. That's an enormous thing. I found a partner who's smarter than I am and incredibly supportive of me. And those, that was luck because I was young and that could have, I easily could have married the wrong person. And, um, I was lucky that she agreed to marry me. And, uh, 
So I'm sure I'm sure now I have a new podcast listener. Amy, welcome to listening to the show. No, no, she, no I think she hears me talking off. I'm, there's no way she's listening. But um, but she, so that enabled me, first of all, always to have somebody to bounce this stuff off of. So I would say for, for people, right, if you do have – if you're a woman and your husband is like, uh, hey, you know, you can never – you know, is un- not supportive, I don't – that – that is the one piece that feels like I don't understand how to tell somebody how to how to transcend sort of if their intimate relationships can't share the dream. I, I don't – because that's not my experience. That's the one piece of it that I had that I know separates me from a lot of people in that I had a supportive – I have a supportive wife who's my best friend and who's there for me. Other than that though – um. You de- we all have the time. I remember... Right, time is never an excuse. I remember that guy who wrote Snow Falling on Cedars because we all heard that story when that book came out like 20 years ago. That person worked like three jobs and would get up at four in the morning and then that book won the National Book Award. And I remember reading that and it feeling like a curse against me because that was when I was still scared to write and telling myself, well, my job requires me to be out late and get and I, there's no way I can do it. And that, I remember that guy was like a teacher and worked a second job and had a family and he would wake up early in the morning and write it. And I was like... You know, you can find the time. Um, but you have to just be comfortable with failure. You have to take your ego out of it. And you have to figure out, uh, you know, what you want and why you want it. So why do you want to play in whatever area you want to play in? Like, what is important about that to you? Why do you need, uh, why do you need to do that? And so when I, I would, a lot of the work I did on, on myself was like figuring out, you know, what I, what I, what I wanted and why I wanted it. Because then when that becomes powerful enough, then you have to sort of follow it, I think. How do you know what it is you wanted? Like that, that, that has to come from some... Feelings at first of being dissatisfaction, right? So you're dissatisfied. I mean, so look, dissatisfied. I still think, as you've talked about in your show, Awaken the Giant Within is one of the, the great resources out there. You know, people look at Tony Robbins sometimes and they think that he's... Um, uh, full of shit, but I, I I have found that that book is just an, was an invaluable resource to me because it made me look at my life and look at where I wanted to be and accept what the dissatisfaction was and then figure out how to close that gap. And so, you know, you do those exercises and you you look at the limiting. I would say this, you know, you look at the limiting beliefs that you have and then. About yourself. The so unconscious. So belief might be, I don't have enough time. I, I don't have enough talent. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the time. Um, my boss will hate me if I do that. My friends will hate me. And a lot of I'm times, selfish. A lot of times it's because people have told you this. Maybe they didn't say you were stupid, but they might have said you can't write a novel. You should have done it 10 years ago. Or yeah. You can't do stand-up. You should have done that 20 but, years ago. But also, like, a lot of people think that it's selfish. They think um, it's selfish to chase a dream. But this is a discovery that I've made, and I'm certain of it. I'm not certain of that much. But I am certain that... Uh, and what's the Springsteen lie, uh, line? Uh, is a dream a lie if it don't come true, or is it something worse? You know. And to me, uh, if you know, if a part of you knows that... There's a thirst that you're not even trying to quench. That there's a creative breakthrough that you are desperate to make, but you're you're kind of shutting your eyes to it. I think you become toxic, I, and I think that that the being thwarted in that way makes you toxic to yourself and to those around you. I mean, the thing when I was 30 and finally had to break through. I mean, I was sitting in my office. I was never a cigarette smoker. I got through my whole teenage years and college years without ever smoking a cigarette. I started smoking. I was overweight. I was miserable. And I, I was like, this, finally, I have to accept that the life I'm living is making me bad to be around, mm-hmm. is making me a bad husband because I'm going to be short with Amy. Well, I'm going to be a bad, you know, you become... You become toxic to those around you. And I just like, that was unacceptable to me. You know, my, what happened when my son was nine months old, I wanted to be able to go home and tell him, go chase your dreams in life. And I wasn't doing it. And I didn't want to be a fucking liar and power that got strong enough in me that I had to crash through. So, so let me ask you this. And I, I agree with everything you're saying, but the big question that comes up is, okay, you went off to become a screenwriter and you made rounders. What would have told you to stop? When would you have said, you know what, I can't do it? 
Well, the line between being an artist and being delusional is very thin. Right, because I'm sure you've met a lot of delusional people. Um, yeah, I, it's unanswerable. You know, other than if you're a sane person, there are clues. If you're a sane person, there are clues that this area, there's something in this area that you, you know, you've, you've been rewarded in some way. You, got a cert, you get a certain kind of endorphin rush doing this thing. You're not faking it. Because as you know, I mean, I did talk about this in the last podcast. Rounders was rejected by every agency when we first wrote it. And I've had that experience repeat itself many times. And, so you have to uh, deal with rejection. You know, but, 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 but you have to deal with rejection. You try to deal with it. It's painful for a day. And then, you, you know, like uh, you, you try to um, dispassionately look at it and figure out where, what's legit in it and what's not. Look, I, I'm, it's very hard to really give a prescription for any of this. Uh, you can only talk about your own experience. I mean, as you said on, on my, my podcast uh, about yourself. I, so I can only say, like, I, I, it was unacceptable to me to not try this stuff because I wanted more than anything to be a good parent and a good husband. And I felt somewhere in my bones that if I didn't do this stuff, I would be bad at those things. Um, because I would uh, be short-tempered. I would be feel like I wasn't making progress. I would feel like I'd sacrificed who I really could be um, in, in, in too great a way for financial, short-term financial certainty. And, and so I, I had to like, the only thing I, get, I had to, I had to crash through it. Um, but I had a lot of stacked in my favor, man. You know, um, I had, like I said, a wife who was super so supportive. Had relationships. I had a best friend. I had yes. a best friend who was willing, who was working at being a writer, who, who was incredibly disciplined and rigorous and focused, who was willing to hear my idea and say like, Oh, I know how to make it better. Let's do this together. Um, and, uh, I was set up to be able, I had put myself in a position that if I could finally just apply myself rigorously, I could succeed at it, but it was incredibly uncertain, but I will say this, you know what I knew? I knew that those two hours, and this is maybe how you can tell without lying to myself. I knew the two hours in the morning that David and I were riding rounders were the two hours that I felt most alive in my work day. So, so again, it's like, it's like your body told you this is the right thing for you to be doing. And it wasn't a bullshit thing that lasted one day. Like even when the writing was hard, those two or even hours when you were getting rejected. Yeah. But forget the rejection part because the, the actual doing of it was hard, right? You sit there and write. It's, I mean, it's hard. Your brain hurts. You're trying to create this. You don't really know how. You have an idea. I mean, you know, it's the thing Salinger quotes at the beginning of uh, one of his books, the Kirk Kierkegaard quote, that, like the characters turn against you right away. You know, you fail. You have this idea, this tone, this feeling in your head, and you fail it. But you, you keep at it. That two hours, I, I just felt, uh, I felt awake and alive. And I, I just wanted that all the time. And, you know, so I built this life now where... Whether I'm in the editing room, which is where you are, we're doing this podcast here at the editing place where we're shooting, we're cutting our pilot billions for Showtime. When I'm doing my podcast, when I'm home with my family, you know, I have, I, I guess I realized then at 30 that that feeling of being alive, it doesn't mean things aren't hard or you don't have bad days or you don't have failure, but um, I don't put myself in situations where I feel dead inside. Boredom, feeling dead inside. Ennui, those things are so painful to me. And because I've had a taste of being on the other side of it, I won't live in those. I, I will, my standard is I will never be in those spots and I will do anything I can to avoid them. So it's interesting because endorphins come from the fight or flight thing. So a lion's chasing you, you're running yeah. for a mile, and then suddenly you need those endorphins to kick in so you can run faster and more and not get as tired. You feel pleasure running from the lion. So... What you did while you're writing Solitary Man is you sort of took a step back and either consciously or subconsciously figured out how am I going to get that endorphin kick? I'm going to throw myself into stand-up comedy. Well, I was miserable. I mean, yeah, I was. Re I can't. You know, it's hard to explain to you, but I knew I'd had half of a thing that would be life-changing for me because if I could finish it and go make it, uh, it would just tell me forever that uh, I wasn't. It wasn't fraudulent. Like I could really do this thing, and so I, I don't I understand that because do clearly you had already done rounders in Ocean's Thirteen. Because human beings are complicated and self-destructive, yeah. man, and <laughs> insecure sometimes, right? So I had made that the gauntlet, and maybe getting up and failing a lot at stand-up, and it took the pressure off, so I could just yeah. write the thing. Um, 
and just do it. You know, but I'm, I'm, by the way, I mean, some of this, sometimes I'm terrible dinner company. If, uh, you know, I'm, I, I will say, like I've said um, in these vines I do, the six second screenwriting lessons, uh, I've said, you know, one of the keys is learning. If you want to, if you want to change your life, you have to learn how to say no. You have to say no to social obligations. You have to say no to all sorts of different things people want you to do to only say yes to the stuff that either is really important for your family or for this, your work or for this new thing you're trying to do. So, you know, I would not, I don't, I, you know, for years I wouldn't go out socially with, I will I still, I don't go out socially with your, if you see me out at dinner with Amy and another couple, I want to be there. I do not do, I zero social obligations. I will never have obligation plans. I will never have a, go to an obligation event, um, a school dinner, a, a show I don't want to see. I like how you call it an family. obligation event. <laughs> I will never do it. It doesn't exist for me. I, I agree with I you. I cut it all out of my life years ago. Because I need that time and because I can't allow myself to settle for feeling crappy and bored. And I will say, yes, that doesn't mean if you're, if you're at work and, you know, your boss says you have to come tonight, uh, just that's part of doing your job. You got to go. Like, so, hey, I'm taking the team uh, out bowling tonight. Yeah, you got to you gotta go do that. But short of those things that are like, um, you know, real work-related obligations – I don't do it ever. I mean, I think ever. it's safe to say no practically gives you a double life, like a second life, because you save so much time. Yeah, and I just say it willingly and with impunity all so, the time. So you, you really test every creative medium. Like you're doing podcasting. We're in the editing room where you're, you're editing Billions, which is going to hopefully you know, be a TV show. We'll talk about that in a second. But also these uh, six-second vines. Uh, you did like – over 300 of them about screenwriting. What, what made you do that? And what's, what I really like is you've done, you repeated it several times. Experts, it's not that they don't know anything, but don't listen to the experts. That, that's kind of a big theme. In well, I think lines. gatekeepers and experts are, um, it's easy for them to talk about. No, it's easy for them to say a different kind of no. Um, because uh, in the short term, they only get fired for a wrong yes, a wrong no. It takes a long time to redound against them. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, I, well, I have a real hatred for charlatans who pretend to be, uh, expert and think, you know, claim they can give you the answer to like how to write um, a movie or how to write a novel because there is no answer. You know, you have to, you have to cover that difficult ground, that terrain by yourself. And, um, and so out of peak one day, I just said into, and I was interested in fine and I just turned on the phone and looked into it and, and said, um, all screenwriting books are bullshit. All of them read screenplays, watch movies, let them be your guide. And I posted it and called it as a joke, six second, six second screenwriting lessons, number one. And then I just got this tidal wave of positive feedback. You got 15 million views in like a few weeks, right? Well, one of the vines has 43 million views. Wow. So, well, what did that one vine say? I don't, I don't remember that. I one. don't even remember. It's number 319. I don't know what it says. Something about giving one more push when you want to quit. Um, but no, my mind's in total of, I'm way over 50 million. Uh, and, um, I'm sure way over that. I don't even know what the number is, but I know the one has over 43 million views. So, um, that, and I, I, I had a rule for that, which was I would do one a day for as long as I had something new to say that I believed was, um, 100% true. And as soon as I didn't, I would stop. So I did like 336 of them. Now maybe I've done 340 of them. I do them when I feel like it. Uh, and the feedback from that has been amazing. People thank me for that. Almost every day I get someone write me to thank me for having, for having done that. And they're just supposed to be little guides to creativity. So, so what's like two or three – what are two or three of your favorite guy, tips on that from that? I mean we've sort of covered them in a longer, in a longer form. I mean I don't – I didn't memorize them. I would think of them – and say them because part of it also was just keeping that really loose and, and free. Um, but the idea is that every day, you know, whatever you are creating, whatever you want to do, uh, whatever unlocking your own creativity means to you, do something every day to develop, like develop a practice that allows you to do that every single day. Right. So, so what I gathered out of the ones I watched, write every day. Yeah. Don't listen to the experts, um, and uh, don't be anything that you're afraid of. Try to tackle it. 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I'm afraid of heroin, but I'm not sticking a spike in my arm. So heroin uh, sounds to me pretty good, actually. I've never that, tried that's it. The, that's the call. Co- <laughs> that's right there is the uh, exact uh, reason for my fear. Um, yeah. No, but yes, within reason. I mean, examine the things that you're afraid of and, and dive in if they're things that ultimately in, inert to your benefit, you know? Now, now, tell me about, and, and, and when, when billions, you know, if God willing it makes it to the air, you know, becomes a show, I want you back on. But what's, what's Billions, the TV show? Well, yeah, Dave and I will come on together when, when that is. It's a show that we created with Andrew Ross Sorkin, the financial journalist, and uh, it uh, stars Paul Giamatti, Maggie Siff, Damian Lewis, and uh, Malin Ackerman. And it's uh, set in uh, the world of the United States Attorney's Office and uh, a hedge fund uh, giant's um, offices. And it's a, a big... Uh, hopefully a big, powerful look at the uh, entire uh, financial legal sector and the way those things um, intersect. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be on for a long time. So, uh, well, we can talk more about that down the road. You came and visited the set, which I thought it was awesome when you visited because I watched you spend a whole day and I, I watched you just sort of taking the whole thing in. And I thought it was great. You know, you didn't you, you stayed out of everybody's way. You paid attention. And I, I thought to myself, this is James living exactly what he says he, he lives, which is you were not there for your own ego. You weren't there to talk. to make, You were there to sort of watch these creative people doing what they did and sort of see how they manifested what it is they are. Can I tell it's you what I life. thought was the most interesting thing to me sure. in, in, the, in the show? And then we can, we can close with that. But uh, uh, I was curious why – so, so um, Neil Berger is directing the first show. He directed yeah. Limitless, Divergent. Limitless is also one of my favorite movies. It's a great movie. And so I wanted to understand what a director of a TV show does because I had no idea. You just follow a script and just have everybody do things. But then I saw something that he was doing that I had never thought of before in a TV show. And he was – He's, of course, it's the first episode as a pilot, so he's going to set the tone for the entire series, whether yeah. he directs it or not. And I noticed every time he shot the hedge fund manager, who's a multi-billion dollar hedge fund manager, it was these wide sweeping shots of a guy controlling the world. You're watching a guy up yeah, there. Yeah, Neil the is visually window. brilliant. I mean, Dave and I produced his first three movies, and we um, have been collaborators for a very long time, and we wanted to work with him because he has a ferocious intellect and a huge visual talent, and he applies those things together so, to what, what, tell this story. Right. What he did was he made the camera a character of the story, which I never thought of before in a TV series. Well, a great pilot director right. adds a tremendous amount, for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I liked watching you watch... All of us do our thing. What was the hardest part in um, writing this first episode for you and making this episode? Oh, man, making things. I mean, that's so. Okay. Because you were very involved. involved. I was watching you. You were going over every note with him. You were standing right behind him. And oh, and he was saying stuff like, that car needs to pull out a quarter second faster. And like, everything well, was happening no, beautifully. Yeah, you, when you're doing this stuff, you're like all the way inside it. But here's the part, you know, about chasing your dreams and, and then the thing you said I say right every day. I've said this before on my own podcast but people often tell you know people who who will often tell you to chase your dreams or they'll say take a step they don't really talk about the fact that um then you just have to work ferociously hard so when you ask what's the hard part the hard part is like every day writing freely writing without censoring yourself and then being disciplined enough to rewrite it and to look at it again and again and again and be ruthless in making it better. So just like standards, you know, lowering your standards enough to actually put words on the page and then making sure you ratchet those standards back up before you decide a thing is finished. And so, you know, just beating the shit out of myself and Dave doing it to himself and Andrew too and us all together making sure that this thing was as good as we could make it at the time. And I'll tell you, editing's the same thing. You constantly look and say, am I telling the story in the way that's absolutely the best without you know, uh, any sympathy or empathy for uh, who I was when I was writing it and hoping that it would be great? You know, it was this line that I thought was really hilarious when I wrote it, really having an effect. And if it's not, yank it out. Killing the babies. Got to do it, man. Hemingway's, you know, Hemingway's right. I mean, that was a great moment in um, making Solitary Man. Ethan and Joel Cohn were, were, you know, probably my favorite of all time, kind enough to come to the editing room. And uh, they watched a cut of the movie Solitary Man. And um, 
Ethan pointed to a moment in a scene and he said, that scene should end right there. Everything after that is nonsense and it hurts you later. You have to go from that moment. You have to make this big cut to a thing that happened five minutes later. And I'll tell you the thing he wanted us to cut was absolutely one of the first things I wrote and was central to why I wanted to tell the story. It was a rap that Michael Douglas gave that, that when I wrote that rap was one of the ways I knew I had the character in mind. And like, I just couldn't imagine cutting it. And I said, Oh, but Ethan. And he was like, listen, man, that was probably the ladder that got you to the roof. And the roof is the project. But once you get to the roof, you've got to kick the ladder away. But you know, and it's I did, Dave and I looked at each other and Dave said, what do you want to do? I said, what do you think? And Dave's like, well, that was Ethan Cohn. So I think we should probably try it. And we, uh, Dave's smart like that. And so we did kick the ladder away and then the, we screened it that night for people and it changed the entire way they watched the movie. Like Ethan was, he saw that in that moment, you, even though Ben's a very hard character to hang with, that was the moment that you really lost, you really lost your compact with Ben. You, you hated him. And by cutting it, we gave the power to another character in the scene and changed the meaning of it. And it made the movie work. I know it's the difference between the movie getting on those lists and not getting on those lists was that five minutes getting cut out of the movie. So, you know, uh, yes. So somehow I had a, you know, Dave and I had relationships with people that got those guys to come. Then we took the ego blow of like listening to them. I I was with a director recently and I said like, we want to have filmmakers come. You should have filmmakers come watch this movie. And he didn't want to because he was scared of it. I want to show stuff to the best filmmakers all the time. Mm-hmm. I want my stuff to be ripped apart once I've done the part that requires me to have the courage, right, originally to write Risking Failure. Mm-hmm. Then I just want to be able to get the best eyes on it, and I want to then figure out what to listen to and what not to based not on ego or my prior conception, but based on the reality on the ground right now. That's another thing that takes, like, discipline and, and hard, hard, hard work and, and – um, but the rewards of doing that are are great. Right, the rewards are great because, and again, all of this is a metaphor for what all of your pro- creative process is a metaphor for doing what we all should be doing, which is striving for autonomy in our decisions, striving for competence, and figuring out all the different ways we can get competence, and uh, you know, in general, striving for well being, doing what we what we want to do. Yes, you said last time I stopped us after forty five minutes. I'm stop. I have to stop us now. All right. Because we'll I have to go back to... We'll, we'll get back together when Billions comes out. Listen, um, dude, this has been a fun day because you did my podcast, in, even though it aired two days ago. I'm doing yours. Uh, this How was do people really find fun. you? The Moment? With the Moment Brian BK. Koppelman. So you can find me. The podcast is called The Moment uh, with Brian Koppelman. I am at Brian Koppelman on Twitter. You can email me anything except screenplay ideas or screenplays or TV ideas. If you send me any of that stuff, I'll, I'll burn it. Um, and I will actually print the email out in order to burn it. I'll never read it. But anything else, you can email me, themomentbk at gmail.com. I read every email, and I reply to everyone eventually, even though it takes me too long to sometimes. James, I'm such a fan of yours and of your show, and um, I hope I didn't ramble too much. No, Brian Ditto, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for coming to the James Altucher Show. We'll do it again. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. I created this idea called Generation W. It's all about educating, inspiring, connecting women. And it's about building community at the same time. It's not like women are on some outpost somewhere, right? Just like you no know, ethnic people are some outpost there, people of color, right? We're all together. So if we learn how to appreciate each other, we elevate one and we elevate us all. And so for the first year, we just, that's where we started. And we had 700 people show up. They had no idea what they were showing up to, but they loved it and they said, we want more. 